first asked to come for the title of this talk, um, I, it was it this past summer, and I had just seen the Marvel movie Ant Man and the Wasp. Has anyone uh, seen that movie? <laughs> there you go. So if anyone's seen it, you know that that's a movie where quantum mechanics is discussed more than oops, quantum mechanics is discussed more than any time I've seen in any popular movie, which was really thrilling. Now it wasn't always discussed correctly, but you know some publicity is better than no publicity, right? So any publicity is good. That's fine. They actually have a thing called the quantum tunnel, and the plot revolves around a character going, getting lost inside the quantum tunnel, and, and inside the quantum realm, he builds a machine that goes through the quantum tunnel. He gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And here's, here's the main character, um, Hank Pym, going through, going through the quantum tunnel. So he builds a machine, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it enters the quantum realm. It goes smaller, smaller, smaller. <laughs> It's crazy here. Warning, approaching quantum void. Which was maybe one of my favorite lines. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it turns out that everything changes in the quantum we had on a scale. He actually enters a quantum void, which I, you know, despite working in this field, had never seen before, and there it was. Um, <laughs> and then even better than that, there's a character there. Her name's Ava, and she actually has quantum mechanical properties. And as I'll talk about, one of the things about quantum mechanics is that you can have superposition. You can be in, you know, you can you can have a person in, in more than one place at a time, or a wave that extends over space. You can go through objects that classically are forbidden. And so you can see, Ava here is a full quantum mechanical object. There's her superposition. Can you see that? Kind of reappears probabilistically. He can go through solid objects like his neck. Um, <laughs> so, so, so not only do we have a quantum tunnel, but Ava had been affected by the quantum world and became a fully quantum mechanical object, displaying all the properties of quantum mechanics. And so, again, this was really exciting to me, and I thought everyone wants to know more about quantum mechanics, even beyond this. So, so this is this was the inspiration for the actual quantum tunnel that's not yet been built, but there are other real ways to quantum tunnel, and I'll talk about that today. Um, the other inspiration is the fact that it feels like quantum mechanics is just everywhere in the news. Has, everyone, has anyone here seen news articles recently on, on quantum mechanics? Right, so, so I read the Times, and just, just in the past year, there have been all these articles on quantum mechanics, on, on racing to make the first quantum computer. Uh, this is probably my favorite. This is Thomas Friedman, who's an economist. He usually talks about like Israel and capitalism. And, and here's a picture of, of him looking at a cryostat that goes to millikelvin temperatures. Right? It could have been his first time in a physics lab, for all I know. But there it was, talking about all the physics that people were missing while they were sleeping. Right? Which is kind of ominous, too. Right? <laughs> while you were sleeping, they're making quantum devices. So, um, and, and the reason I think that a lot of people it's ominous is that you know, one of the big reasons quantum spends so much in the news is that you know, we're not the only ones trying to build quantum technologies. Uh, the Chinese very recently launched a quantum satellite where they put a satellite into space and had photons that were entangled, connected quantum mechanically, going back and forth from space to Earth. The first time this had been done, uh, you can see that there's articles about quantum clearing a major hurdle on the way to ultra-secure quantum communications, which led to enormous amounts of hand-wringing in the military and the, in the national security establishments. And you'll hear just a lot about you know, who's going to win the quantum race. It's the next big, big race to win, to get to be the first you know, quantum country, I guess, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but, to, but to, get to really be the first to get some of these quantum technologies, and all this hand-wringing has led to articles like this, you know, China has the lead in the next leap in computers, for example, which, you know, on the one hand, I don't like titles like this, it makes things seem weirdly competitive, whereas a lot of us went into science to learn. On the other hand, it leads to more funding, which is good. So, um, <laughs> so you know, there's been, in the meantime, there's been all these quantum startups, um, companies that are actually making devices for quantum encryption, um, making devices for quantum computing, and uh, along with that, um, questions about how are we going to get researchers to work in quantum mechanics. It's the next big tech shortage. So this is really relevant for future technologies, for understanding what's driving a lot of the funding, and even for looking at jobs for the future. Now, related to all of this, and partially because of all of this, just three weeks ago, um, Congress and the President signed into law the National Quantum Initiative Act. Now, this is something that had been in the works for a long time, and you can see here it was signed on December 21st of 2018. So extremely new. Um, 
And I'm sorry this isn't, and you can, I put this here so you can show that if you go to the congressional website and click on it, it says law, right? It's now a law. Um, and I'm sorry this is small print, but most of this is kind of gobbledygook. It doesn't really matter. It's just kind of like we're doing quantum programs to establish plans for quantum programs that are quantum-like. Um, <laughs> it, it defines quantum mechanics, quantum information science as storage, transmission, manipulation, or measurement of information that's encoded in systems that can only be described by the laws of quantum physics, quantum quantum, um, uh, <laughs> Professor Hamill was great because he looked at this and he kind of skimmed it and said, ooh, they're making quantum centers. And that's a really big part of it is that they have money here to start new quantum, quantum uh, research centers for, uh, for research and education. Um, if you look at this website, it's really hard to figure out exactly what they're committing, but when I looked at other news sites, it said that there's $1.2 billion associated with it, um, which is a lot of money. Um, whether it's new money or old money, I don't know, hopefully it won't be taken out of our other grants, but it's still a lot of money. And so this is new, and you know, from a national initiative, there'll be new centers and research all focusing on quantum mechanics starting today, three weeks ago. It's ongoing. Okay, so, so that was the motivation for the topic of this talk. You know, so with all this stuff going on in quantum mechanics, with all this, these initiatives and, and popular media and stuff, what does it really mean to go through the quantum tunnel? Uh, what it, so I'll talk today, start with the basics of quantum mechanics, um, and then I'll talk about measuring quantum electronic devices. Um, there are a lot of ways of thinking about and studying quantum mechanics. You can study um, light, you can study individual atoms. What I do is look at electronics, and since I'm here, I'm going to talk about what I do mostly. So we'll focus on quantum electronic devices, and then end with a discussion of quantum computers, which is a sort of quantum electronic device. Okay, so, so quantum mechanics is, basically quantum mechanics is a theory that describes nature at the smallest scales, okay? And this is not just in the honey I shrunk the kids sort of ants look big kind of scale, right? This is a ant-man, quantum void, what's going on here kind of scale, okay? So the, the, the difficulty here is that as you get really, really small, Nature is, is, is dominated by different laws than the ones that we are really accustomed to. And this is what makes quantum mechanics seem confusing and, and counterintuitive. And in fact, um, one of the great physicists, John Wheeler, said, if you're not completely confused by quantum mechanics, you do not understand it. Okay? So, so it's intrinsically something that, that's not, that we don't see and manipulate every day. We don't see wave and particle properties at the same time in our everyday experience, and yet at the small scale, it exists. Now the fact that quantum mechanics is somewhat confusing um, is what makes it seem counterintuitive, which makes it seem hard, and especially for physicists. You know, as physicists, we really like everything to be completely understandable. And so it's hard thinking about quantum mechanics, and even some of the architects of quantum mechanics, let's just earlier Edmund Schrodinger, said, I do not like it, and I'm sorry I have ever had anything to do with it. <laughs> this is just because it's confusing. Who likes to be confused? It's hard. Um, this reminds me a, a, a little bit of the, uh, of the old, of the, it, it, this is sort of like the, the, the physics equivalent of the, of the old uh, curse, may your life be interesting. Right? Quantum mechanics is interesting. <laughs> and maybe even useful, actually definitely useful. Okay, so when did quantum mechanics start? I think the real start of quantum mechanics was in 1900 with Max Planck. <coughs> the Max Planck was commissioned by a light bulb company to try to make brighter and more efficient bulbs, right? Very pedestrian stuff. And so he wrote a theory of how the light is radiated from a bulb and found out that nothing he did would fit the theory. He kept trying to think of energy as these continuous things and waves, and it just didn't fit the theory ever, until out of desperation he came up with the idea that energy is not continuous, but rather comes in small packets. And these packets are called quanta, and the value of the quanta of energy is given by a constant, which we now call Planck's constant, <coughs> extremely small as you can see, times the frequency. Okay? This means that when you see radiation or anything coming out, it's not continuous, but rather quantized in these small packets. And as Planck himself said, he, does, he, he came up with this theory as an act of despair. Right? I love quantum mechanics, there's all these people saying, no, why does this work this way? <laughs> but it does, he said it was an act, act of despair. He was ready to sacrifice any of his previous convictions about physics. And so I, I find this quote really interesting, because it does tell you that it really overturned what people thought they knew, but it works. It's the only way of understanding what really works when you think about things like energy. 
So then five years later, Einstein came along, and Einstein was looking at experiments where if you take a piece of metal and you hit them with light, right, just shine light on metal, then electrons are emitted. But there's a threshold where only light of a certain energy can emit electrons. And again, Einstein realized the only way to really explain this experiment was by hypothesizing that light was not um, a wave, but rather made up of particles that had, again, this tiny quantum of energy. So this is very confusing now, right? We know that light is a wave, right? Because it has interference effect. In previous years, hundreds of years prior, there have been all sorts of experiments showing that light interfered with itself. It had some position. It's displayed all these wave-like properties. But now it says that it's a particle. So how is something both a particle and a wave? What does that even mean? So let's think about particles and waves. Right? So particles, particles we know of. We use things like basketballs, right? You take a basketball and you bounce it, and it doesn't go through the floor. That would be weird, right? It hits the floor and it bounces back. That's what it's supposed to do. You take two basketballs, you hit them together, they bounce out in the opposite direction. They don't make a bigger basketball, right? That's not what we expect. That doesn't happen. And that's true for everything that we think of as a particle, even little nanoparticles. You can see them. They just kind of sit on top of each other. On the other hand, there are waves. We also know waves. We see them in the water. They're spaced a certain way. They have amplitude. They have wavelength. They have frequency. Waves can be superimposed on each other. You see interference patterns where two waves can add or they can subtract from each other. Right? They even pass through each other in a way that's expected. You've probably seen water waves or other sorts of waves can pass through each other. So waves and particles seem like completely different things. Right? So now you can ask yourself, is there is there a time in your, in your everyday life where you've seen something act like a particle and a wave at the same time? Does anyone ever? No, right? <laughs> you haven't. <laughs> it's, just, it's not what happens. We have basketballs. They don't go through the floor. They don't interfere. So in our everyday life, we don't experience things as both particles and waves. This instead happens when things are really, really small, not in the things that we deal with, the heavy things we deal with every day. And again, this is what makes these concepts difficult. We have to accept that something that seems counterintuitive from our everyday experience actually works. I think of this as, as, as sort of chicken and waffles, right? In my mind, it's not intuitive that they go together. But when they do, it's delicious. <laughs> so, so quantum mechanics, like chicken and waffles, is delicious. And it works. You, and, and, you have to, and you have to do the experiment to figure it out. That's the other thing, right? You have to actually eat that bite of waffles with chicken, with the spicy syrup, and then you realize, yeah, this is amazing, right? Exactly like quantum mechanics. You do the experiment, and it seems to work. OK. so. So we have, we have light as a wave. You can see interference patterns in light, light and dark, light and dark um, regions where light interferes. And then Einstein comes along and says light's a particle. So OK, people kind of get used to that. But then 20 years later, de Broglie comes along and says, it's not just light, but everything has both wave and particle properties, all matter. Now this seems even crazier because you know we are part of everything, and we are not superimposing on things. So, you know, the question is, is this realistic? If we have wavelengths, can we actually interfere with things? So then we can ask ourselves, you know, what, what, is, what is our wavelength, right? Do we have a wavelength? The answer is yes, we, we, should, we have a wavelength that you can measure, and it's not the wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if we did, it would be cool, right? You can, see, you can see headlines like this, like people can't start interfering with their lives, right? You can think of them as physically interfering and, you know, bypass it. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> What is our wavelength? Our wavelength turns out, you can, you can measure our wavelength just by taking Planck's constant and dividing it by our momentum. We're walking at some speed, we have some average mass, and you get a value that's something like 10 to the minus 36 meters. That's a really small number. Anyone know the age of the universe? Or the, I'm not sorry, the size of the universe? It's like 10 to the 26 meters, right? So this is like a factor of you know, 10 to the 10 smaller than the universe is large. That gives you a sense of it. It's really small. It's much smaller than an individual atom. So even though you could theoretically define a wavelength for us, it's so small that at our weight and speeds, you would never, ever see it. So unfortunately, at our size, you don't see wave interactions. But you can observe this in small objects. OK, there's two other things I want to mention about quantum mechanics uh, before we go on to quantum devices. One principle is that because quantum states 
are, 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 are wave-like, they extend through space. Uh, they're not defined by a single property, but rather we talk about probability theory to define the outcomes of, of, a, of, um, of a quantum device, quantum mechanical object. So imagine something spread out through space, and you ask, where is this object at any given time? There's some probability of it being at different locations in space. Um, and this is related to this, this Schrodinger's uncertainty principle, which maybe some people have heard about, where you, know, you don't know exactly where the atom is, and the atom you know, actually you know, sets up some trigger that kills a cat that's in a box, but because you don't know where the atom is, maybe it doesn't pull the triggers, then maybe the cat's alive, and maybe the cat's dead, and uh, that's Schrodinger's bed. Um, Right. Um, so that, that's one part of quantum mechanics. And the other, the other really important um, tenet of quantum mechanics is that is this observer principle that you can't observe a microscopic system without altering some of its properties. And I like the way this physicist Lawrence Krauss put it, that at the heart of quantum mechanics, the rule that sometimes governs politicians or CEOs, as long as no one is watching, anything goes. <laughs> so so, so it, it's a little bit like this. Um, you know, you could, you, in, on one hand, you can think of this in a, in a really um, almost trivial way as, you know, if you're trying to measure the air pressure in your, in your car tire, you have to let a little bit of pressure out in order to measure it, which alters the measurement of the pressure itself, right? So photons hit things, you measure it, and that alters them. So that's one way of thinking about it. But there's an even, even deeper way of thinking about it, which is that even if you have, let's say, two atoms that are quantum mechanically entangled or connected over distances further apart than information can travel, they can still affect each other's states. Okay, that's one of the crazy things about quantum mechanics. That also means that. Okay, so those are the basics of quantum mechanics. We have, we have wave particle duality. We have probability theory. Uh, we have the observer uh, principle, and we also have quantization. Now, all of these are really interesting, um, but I work on quantum mechanical electronic devices, and when we look at solid state quantum devices, I've circled these are the things that, that I look at most of the time. There, there are things here, probability theory, that are useful when you're thinking of extended wave properties and atoms, but for electronic devices, usually we look at the wave properties and the quantization of, of energy. Um, you know, I grew up in a household where, where um, my, uh, my father was a philosopher, who's had a great interest in philosophy, and so um, you know, he, would, he was always talking about kind of the idea of quantum mechanics. You know, no one, no one really knows what's ever going to happen, or we can't tell if that's real or not real. Um, and I admit that at some point that sort of annoyed me because <laughs> it just it wasn't my experience with science, and so maybe that's why I went into what I call the dirty regions of quantum mechanics, which is the really grounded. I'm making a device, and I'm watching the electrons, and we're going to see what they do. <laughs> and I don't know. Well, we'll just come up with the answer there. So you know, there's sort of the, the philosophical view of of what quantum mechanics is, which is extremely interesting in and of itself. But then there's those of us who just really want to measure and understand cool devices using quantum mechanics as well. OK, so, so what does quantum have to do with electronic devices? Right? We have electronics all around us governing our world. And why do we care about quantum mechanics? Because you know, these things work, and they're just uh, you know, they're made of what? Electronics. <laughs> Magic. Who knows? Right? So, so what does it have to do with it? Well, electronic devices deal with electron conduction, right? So you can think of these very classically, right? If you think of a, a simple circuit as electrons, as these tiny charged particles that carry electrical current in a material. So here we have just a battery, and here's a light bulb, and electrons, these little particles that flow around a wire, and they hit the light bulb, and maybe they heat up a piece of metal, and that metal emits light, and that's an old style light bulb. Or maybe they hit a diode, and you know, a semiconductor, something magical quantum happens there, and then it emits light. Okay, but basically electrons are particles that go around and, and cause things to flow. So a very simple electronic device looks something like this. It's a resistor, which is really any sort of material. A voltage is a battery, and you measure the current going around it. And the current is just the charge flowing per unit time, proportional to the number of electrons. So it seems like in, in classical electronics, electrons are really just particles that have a number. So they're particles, but of course they're also waves. You said that de Broglie said that matter has a wave-like nature. This has really been confirmed in electrons directly by looking at electron interference and diffraction. This is another one of the great feats of physics, showing that electrons, despite the fact that they had mass and were much larger than photons, for example, um, can also interfere um, and show wave-like properties. Okay? So why and when 
the wave properties of electronics matter, if we think of them as particles in most of our very simple circuits. Okay? Well, it matters when devices are very, very small. Now, I have a little caveat here. Okay, it's a long caveat. Well, okay, three-line caveat, which is, which is I'm going to be focusing on the quantum mechanics of due to the smallness of devices. Actually, if you want to understand any material at an atomic and electronic level, you have to understand quantum mechanics, because we do treat the electrons as waves, even in just understanding how they work in any material at all. If you want to understand semiconductors, you have to understand quantized energy levels. Okay, so the fundamental understanding of materials does rely on quantum mechanics. But I'm going to ignore that and focus on once we assume that we have a material that we understand, what happens when we make it small and how does quantum mechanics come in? Okay. So the electron wavelength is of the order of a nanometer. Okay, again, the wavelength of the person, much, much bigger. This is seeming pretty much smaller, I mean. This is seeming pretty big compared to a person wavelength. And a nanometer is actually a scale that's becoming realistic for nanoelectronic devices. Nano means nanometer, 10 to the minus ninth meters, right? So nanomaterials are already at the scale of electron wavelengths. So devices these days are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We all want smaller iPhones and, and smaller iPods and small little robots that can spy on us. Okay, we don't want that, but we can get them, I guess, right? But inevitably, things are getting smaller, more accustomed to having nano devices. And even the big electronics that we have are getting more powerful because they're run by smaller and smaller electronics. So if you pry open a computer, you'll see the motherboard, which is the, the heart of the computer. That's what runs it, runs, runs all the computations in there. And the heart of that is a microprocessor. And the microprocessor is run by transistors. These are the things that turn the current, the little tiny currents, on and off inside a computer. Right. So um, a, a computer does operations with bits. A bit can be a one or a zero, and you can think of that as a current on as a one, and a current off as a zero, for example. Right? That's what does all the computations, and every trans transistor is a byte. Right? Or a bit. Or a byte, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> it's the on-off of the computer bit. Okay. Um, so a lot of research that I do, really fundamental physics research. I look at new materials, I look at the electronics of new materials, and I'm really interested in just what materials do. But somewhere in the back of my mind and in the front of my grants is written, you know, we really care about making transistors smaller, about making these elements smaller, about understanding what happens as we make these things smaller, and seeing the limits of, of size of these sort of transistors, which then gives us the limits of size and power on all of our electronic devices. So, Inside the microprocessor is what's called an integrated circuit. It has all the elements that you need to do processing. And if you take a cross-section of this, it looks like alien spaceships landing. Um, this is actually, it's, it was, this is really a great feat of modern electronics in that, in that the transistors are patterned on the very bottom. And then all the connections to the transistors are then 3D, they're patterned in 3D on top of that to make these things as compact and interconnected as possible. But if you then look at the individual transistors, they look something like this. They're 50 nanometers or smaller, right? And this is basically a current can go across here, and then it can be turned off by an electric pulse that is put on the top. So you put a pulse on the top, and it can control whether the, gate, whether, whether the current can go through this element or not. And that controls your local current and your bit. Basically, a voltage flows depending on, or a current flows depending on the voltage on this thing. Now, these transistors are really small, and uh, the head of, of, of Intel many years ago, Gord Moore, found that the size of transistors had been having, he, he make, experimentally found that transistor sizes had been having every 18 months. And so they started out pretty small, um, tens of microns. Okay, this is something that's a little, you know, sort of a tenth the size of a human hair, very small. But now they've gone small enough that they're smaller than an Ebola virus. I don't know why an Ebola virus would be small, but okay, that's an Ebola virus. <laughs> okay, so, so they're smaller than a virus, right? They're, they're extremely small. Um, and, and you can also see, because these are so small, we can fit more and more of these onto computer chips. So we're at the stage right now where there are 30 billion transistors on a processor. Okay? And this was last year, there's probably even more now. Okay? 30 billion transistors that are fit onto a processor. That's a lot of transistors. And the only thing limiting them is their size, right? This is the 14 nanometer size transistors already. 
Okay, so, so this is great. We can just keep making transistors smaller and smaller and smaller and get more and more of them on a chip and get more and more power out of the computers and the world is fine. But the world is not fine for many reasons, but the transistor world is not fine because of quantum mechanics. <laughs> And then that means because we are reaching fundamental physical limits to shrinking our conventional electronics. And this is because quantum mechanics is preventing transistors from fully turning off. So let's look at an example of how we turn on and off a transistor. Imagine an electron is flowing, electrons are flowing from one side to another, and we put a voltage pulse on here to try to shut them off. So the voltage pulse is is on there and they don't flow, and we put a voltage pulse on and they do flow, for example. Right? The voltage pulse on, they flow, voltage pulse off, they don't flow. Now, what if the region of zero voltage is so narrow here that it's comparable to the wavelength of electrons? Right? So if that region is really narrow and electrons are waves, we have something that's called real quantum mechanical tunneling. And this is not the tunnel that you go through to reach the quantum void, but rather the tunnel that means there's some probability of waves continuing through a barrier um, that classically would be forbidden to them. So if this barrier is really thick, then the waves just stop. Okay? But if this barrier is really thin, then the waves can continue on the other side. Okay? Um, and again, it's called tunneling, obviously, because they, they go through as if there's a tunnel, but in this case, it's really part of the probability. There's a finite probability of a wave continuing on this side of a barrier. And typically, if you have barriers of the scale of about five nanometers, then you can have waves that have energies of typical currents in transistors continuing on the other side of the barrier. Okay? So this puts a limit to how far you can shrink conventional electronics. With quantum tunneling, the current flows even when you don't have a voltage on there. So there's no way of turning off your bit. There's no bit at all because you can't turn it off anymore, right? So you can't turn the. You can you can try to put more power on, for example, right? But but then you have to put so much power on that eventually you can do some calculation that the computer will be I don't know hotter than the temperature of the sun or something, like that, right? And they're already pretty hot. Right? Everyone knows you put a computer on your lap, it's really hot, right? That's because you're getting a lot of power dissipated with all these transistors running little little tiny currents. But when there's 30 billion of them. That's a lot of current going through, and that's a lot of power, just heating power from these little, little tiny elements. And so at some point, if you try to put more and more power on these things, it gets hotter and hotter, so you can't run at high power without overheating. Um, you can't make this any thinner because you get a current going without a voltage, and then we're basically stuck. You can't make transistors infinitely small. There is a fundamental quantum mechanical limit to Moore's law and to scaling down electronic elements. And this is something that's been really frightening, I think, for the microelectronics community, and even for the economy in general, because people look at Moore's Law and assume that every year we're going to get faster and more powerful computers and smaller things. But at some point coming soon, that just may not happen with traditional scaling. It just can't happen in the same way. So, so what's being done about this? Well, you know, the semiconductor industry, there's extreme, it's extremely clever, it's extremely high tech. They've done great science and technology there. And they do things like they, they, they slightly strain the transistors and that makes it harder for current to flow or they add different materials that make it harder to, for current to flow even as they make it smaller. Um, they make fins that dissipate the power more effectively. There's lots of little things you can do, but at some point you enter this limit where you can't do any more and that's where you enter research and new sorts of materials. Um, and that's basically what, what I do research on right now, is, and a lot of people, is, is looking at, at new materials that can make ultra-small, low-power dissipation, high-sensitivity devices that maybe even show novel effects. And here's just some examples. There's things like graphene, which is a two-dimensional sheet of carbon atoms arranged in a hexagonal pattern. Um, you can roll this into a tube and get carbon nanotubes. You can have little semiconducting nanowires that are less than five nanometers, but because they're, they're, they have different crystal structure, they're long and narrow, they have different properties than standard transistors. So research into these things is ongoing to see if there's anything that can be done in terms of new behaviors or scaling of these sort of devices that has eluded us so far with traditional semiconducting architectures. Okay, so how do we study quantum electronic devices. What sort, of, what sort of behaviors do we see in these? Well, we study them just the way I showed you. We take some, a little device, like a light bulb, okay, but this is gonna be some material, and put electrons through it. 
and then see how well materials conduct electrons and what the resistance is to electron flow. Okay, so, so basically, almost every experiment we do in my lab looks like this, <laughs> kind of, except it, it really does look like this. Right? We have a material, we, we ask like a resistor, and we put a voltage across it and we measure the current. Okay? So, um, you know, we do it at low temperatures and it looks fancier, the circuits are smaller, but at the end of the day, it's basically this. There's something, you know, you know, classically there's something called Ohm's law, which tells you the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. And then we look for things that deviate from Ohm's law. You know, when you have quantum mechanics and wave properties, you don't expect to get this sort of thing anymore. Um, we measure things um, as a function of different sorts of variables, things like temperature and gate voltage, magnetic or electric fields. Um, again, our measurements are pretty much like this. We take a fluke, I don't know if you use a fluke at home, like to test batteries and stuff. Right, okay. We take a fancy fluke right, and then put it across the resistor and it tells us what our conductance is. Um, we do often measure at relatively low temperatures. This is to remove what we call really boring thermal effects. Um, our physics is really boring at our temperatures. We're kind of boring physics-wise. We're interesting biologically at our temperatures, but physics-wise it's boring. So we're just dominated by thermal effects. And those are pretty well known. So if you want to get rid of thermal effects, you have to go to, um, to, to, to much lower temperatures where the thermal effects aren't affecting you, but the quantum mechanical energy levels are relevant. Because imagine a quantum, remember the quantum energy levels are really, really small, right? A quanta is a really small energy. Right? It's usually much, much lower than the temperature. So you want to go to temperatures near absolute zero where these quanta of energy are actually relevant suddenly. And these are temperatures near something like you know, 10, 15 milli degrees above absolute zero. Okay. And actually, you can get there um, pretty easily these days with commercial systems that just use evaporative cooling. So in the same way that you can, you can take the, if you uh, pump um, pump water vapor out of water, you can lower its temperature. Right? In the same way, we pump helium-4 out of helium, and we get to lower temperatures, or you can pump helium-3 out of a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4, and it turns out that gets you to, to very low temperatures. And if you put those samples in devices that look like this, it looks complicated, the sample sits in the bottom, but really all this is is a pump for helium that pumps evaporatively cooled helium at the bottom, and then the rest of the thing is to reduce the effects of room temperature, right? So you want to separate this thing from room temperature, and usually the whole thing sits in a cryostat that cools liquid helium degrees. And that's, again, just to separate it from room temperature um, and to make sure things stay cold. So I'll show you this again. Okay, so what are examples of some of the surface? So let's say you want to go out, which I'm sure everyone wants to go out and measure quantum devices. <laughs> well, how do you do that, and what do you see? Okay, so I'm going to take one of, my, one of my favorite quantum devices, which is a carbon nanotube. These are kind of old science. At this point, by old, it's like 10 years. Science progresses fast. But they're still incredibly cool. As I said, these are, these are tubules of carbon, of these graphene sheets that are rolled into tubes. And the tubes naturally have diameters of less than a nanometer. And you can just grow these in an oven in the lab. I mean, literally, there's an oven, and you flow some hydrogen through it, and nanotubes grow. It's, it's really pretty amazing. Um, they look like narrow wires, but because their diameter is an order of a nanometer, they intrinsically will show quantum effects at low temperatures. Okay, so we then measure the conductance. Again, it's very simple measurement. This is our nanotube. We put a voltage across it, and we measure its current as a function of things like temperature magnetic field, and sometimes we apply an additional um, electronic gate, like you saw in the transistor, to try to turn it on and off and see what happens there. Okay, here's actual nanotube, and this is a, a real picture of the device. It's pretty small. And this is the sort of data that we get. Okay? This doesn't look like what you'd see from just a wire and a light bulb, or just from measuring the conductance of a wire. There's something weird going on here. This is conductance, and this is energy, and there are these peaks there. Okay? These peaks are due to the quantized nature of conductance at low temperatures and low energies in very, very small devices. And it's really cool. So these is, this is quantized conductance showing electrons going on and off this little segment of wire. So every electron that goes on, you get a peak in conductance, and then another electron goes on, you get a peak in conductance. And the spacing of these energy levels is determined by the quantization of energy inside the nanotube itself. And so intrinsically, this is a quantum mechanical device where you see this quantization just as you know, peaks on, on, your, on your data accumulation screen. Uh, we can also do things like, like measure what happens as we put electrons through and see if they bounce back and forth between our leads, can we see interference? Okay. 
And we do this by putting a magnetic field on them. Because if you put a magnetic field through the center of it, as they go back and forth, they start, you can actually see how the interference shifts with magnetic field. And so here's a plot of that. This is a 2D plot of conductance where the black regions are low conductance, the light regions are high conductance. And do you see the kind of triangle patterns going across here? These are interference patterns of electrons going back and forth in an nanotube. And I just love seeing data like this because it's showing that you know, electrons really act like just ballistic conductors bouncing back and forth, and they have a wavelength that just extends over this physical object and interferes with each other. And once you can measure things like this, you can start using them in real sorts of devices. Okay. Um, this is just another example of a, a newer sort of material we, we, we work on. This is something that we call, that we call, that everyone calls topological insulators. They have insulating bulks and conducting surfaces. So again, we did an experiment on these where we wanted to see how electrons interfered with each other as they traveled around the outside of this wire. So only the surface is conducting, so we looked at electrons going one way around the surface and electrons going the other way around the surface and wanted to see if they interfered with each other. And lo and behold, we saw these very clear oscillations of electrons interfering with each other as they went around the outside of these nanowires. Um, and so this was exciting for various reasons, showing that we could see the interference, and also these materials are interesting for other sorts of quantum computing and new sorts of devices. And this is just to show that you know we can take we often will take all sorts of new materials and see what are their quantum do they do they display quantum properties? What are these properties, and could they be useful for anything? Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is. We've talked about making these quantum devices, measuring these quantum devices, but can we improve computing beyond simply scaling down? And the answer is yes, and this brings us to this topic of quantum computers. Okay. So quantum bits, we call qubits, can store more information and perform more calculations than classical computers using things like wave superposition and what we call entanglement, which is when you have these waves that it can be in two states at once connected. Okay. Um, a physical realization of a qubit can be really any two-level system. Okay? So you can take an atom that can have two states. Remember these quantized states? This is a quantized energy level in an atom where you have one state and it's separated from, one, from the other one by a quantized energy. Okay? So you can have a state that has an atom, say, in, in the ground state, in an excited state. There's two levels here. And then you can have a superposition of states. Right? This is already a qubit because you can represent it by something that has some probability of being in one state and some probability of being in the other state. And with this, you can perform, I'll show, quantum manipulations. And actually, you can take something like this device I talked about, right, which is just a really small nanowire of some sort, and even consider something like this, like an artificial atom, where you can take these states and say, okay, this is one state, this is another state, and can we couple these states and manipulate interactions between them, right? Can we put two of these together, one in one state, one in the other, and actually get them to superimpose between these two states? And so it can, it's really a very physical system that can be a qubit, right? Or you can say, you know, maybe these different states have different spins. Um, electron spins is another quantum mechanical property of electrons, but whatever. It's just another thing that electrons have, that another property of them, that you can separate out as you isolate these individual energy levels in these atoms or even artificial atoms and then try to manipulate them for quantum computing. So we can have an atom, you can have spins, you can even use photons and look at different states of polarization. All of these can be qubits. So why does superposition help us do quantum computing? Um, it's because you can have many more superimposed states than you can just classical states. As an example of that, if we took an electron like this and said, OK, in this state it's a 1, and in this state it's a 0, a classical number would have to be either one state or the other, a 1, a 0, a 1, a 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and that makes a 5. Okay? So these four states make one number. But quantum mechanically, since you could be in a superposition of any of these states, you can have many more possibilities of numbers as the same number of bits. Another very physical way of putting it is saying, if you have a classical three-bit number, say 101, right, this is all, this is the only state you can have, whereas three entangled qubits can be any fraction of this combination here. Right? So which means that classically you would have just three bits, and quantum mechanically, you can have eight bits. Or classically you have n bits, and quantum mechanically you have two to the n bits. 
And if you notice, that scales really well for quantum computing. Because if you have a 64-bit processor, classically, you have 64 bits, and quantum mechanically, you have 10 to the 19 bits. And 10 to the 19 is, you know, one with 19 zeros after it. It's a lot of zeros. It's a really big number. It tells you you can do massively parallel processing with quantum computing, which is just impossible with classical computing. Okay. Okay, so then you can ask yourself, well, do we really need quantum computers? Um, you know, maybe our lives already revolve too much around, <laughs> around computers, and having more powerful computers may not, may not make us happier, healthier, wealthier, or wiser. Um, and yes, that's probably true. I agree. But there are things that you could possibly do with massively more powerful computing that we may not be able to imagine. Right? Maybe we can predict the weather you know, weeks in advance rather than two days in advance. Maybe we can predict um, our, own, our own biology, our own DNA in a way that's helpful to us and keeps us more disease free in the future. All right, there are possibilities here that really can only be enabled by new sorts of technology like this. Okay. Now, in the, in the shorter term, there are really, there are some key applications that I think are driving um, some of the push toward the quantum computer, especially from, from the government, this is things like factoring large numbers and sorting databases. So quantum computers can do math, can do parallel processing. So they're really good at sorting things. They're not really good at coming up with just, you know, asking a question and coming up with one answer. But they're really good at saying, if I have, you know, a billion different possibilities, which one fits best? Okay. And one of the ways, one of the things that can solve that way is is factoring large numbers. So public key encryption, which is the basis of all of our secure um, information passage on computers, right? If you don't want to do any banking unless it says there's some sort of public key encryption, for example, right? Is based on this factoring of large numbers. Um, it knows that, that multiplying numbers is a lot easier than factoring them. So if I told you to multiply these two numbers, you could do it. If I asked you, what are the prime factors of this number? It would be a really hard problem. You'd have to try lots and lots and lots of different numbers to get that answer. Um, so public key encryption works by saying, you know, my, my bank, I, I know that my bank has this number, right? My bank sends me information that's multiplied by this number, and then when I get it, I just divide it by that number, and I get the number my bank has been trying to send me. Okay, I get a much smaller number, for example. So, so factoring is hard, multiplying is easy, and, and that's the idea behind public key encryption. And you can see in this plot how much easier factoring is for a quantum computer versus a classical computer. So this is the number, this is digits in a, in a, in a factorable number, right? And if it had 129 digits, a one gigahertz PC would take about four months. A, uh, a petaflop, which is 10 to the 15 operations per second, a um, supercomputer would take one second, and a quantum computer would take 10 seconds. That seems okay. It's faster than a PC, but not much faster than a supercomputer. But as you increase the number of digits, say to 300, a PC takes the age of the universe, <laughs> a supercomputer takes 20 million years, and a quantum computer takes just 200 seconds. So this is the sort of thing that only quantum computers can really do. Now you may say, okay, if you figure out how to factor large numbers, then no one's security is safe, because everyone can do it, and that's true, and that's not my problem. So, um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really understand how these things work or why someone decides that everyone needs it, but the fact is, it's cool to be able to do it, and it does show you the potential power of a quantum computer for solving some things that classically can't be done. Okay, so, so why can't you just buy a quantum computer, right? It looks like, you know, we can make these little devices with two-level systems, we can do this computing, we can, we can destroy our entire security system equally, like, you know, nuclear bombs or something, I guess, and then, um, you know, then we're all happy at buying quantum computers to do more gaming on. Um, and the reason we can't buy these is because quantum engineering and real devices are very messy. Has anyone seen the show Nailed It? Yeah, okay, cooking shows? Okay. Yeah, thank you. It, yeah, exactly. So Nailed is a show where it, it's kind of bad. They show, they show, they give people things to make, and then people make them. <laughs> and they're usually pretty bad. So, so in my mind, you know, this is, this is prediction, and this is what real experiments look like, right? There, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong when you're really trying to do an experiment. You know, so for quantum experiments, 
for technology, we need well-defined qubits, we need scalability, we need coherence, but any tiny bit of disorder or scattering or thermal fluctuations or electrical excitations or a little tiny speck of an unexpected atom in your material just adds enough noise that it can change the state of your quantum of your qubit and destroy superposition. Right? It's really easy to destroy quantum coherence, which is basically the superposition state that's required for, for quantum computing. And so this is the essential dichotomy. You want weak coupling to the environment to avoid decoherence, but you need strong coupling to ensure high speed and reliability, and it's really hard to get both of these at the same time, and it's really not been done satisfactorily yet. Okay. So that, that's the limiting factor. It doesn't mean people aren't trying. In fact, just remember the data. This is from January 8th, 2019, I think. Right? So just a couple of days ago was a news article about IBM unveiling its first commercial quantum computer. It's a Q System 1, it's 20 qubits, um, it's based on superconductors, which are the type of two-level system. Um, what I love about it is it said it was not for sale. And so I didn't really understand how it was commercial and not for sale, but okay, it's, 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 it's there. Um, but, but this is, uh, you know, but you know, the there's probably there. And I also like that there's this, this very high-tech, spaceship-y seeming thing that you imagine there's, there's uh, some, I don't know, what do you imagine in there that's going on? It's some like alien head doing quantum computing secretly or something inside the spaceship, right? Um, but actually, this is just a cryostat, as I said. This is the what, you know, if you go to my lab, you'll see doers that look like this, and inside of it is a dilution refrigerator that gets thin cold, just like we have. So it's, it's really, you know, it's high tech, but it's the same thing that I showed you that is just necessary to get things very cold, right? Even though it looks cooler when it's all black and lit up. Um, so IBM has its first computer. Um, there's been a, a lot of recent articles about uh, Google, IBM, and Intel all trying to get a 49 qubit quantum chip in 2019. So this is a picture of Intel's chip. Um, this came out just a couple days ago. They call it Tangle Lake, kind of like entangled. Like, they call it Tangle Lake. Um, there, there's no evidence that, so there's, it's funny, they, they've unveiled this 20 qubit computer where they've, they've tried to entangle 20 qubits. There's no, there's no, it's not clear that they can actually entangle 49 qubits, but they're just trying to make them. The other problem here is that they make these things, but they still have a lot of errors, right? And if you think about how much we rely, rely on computers, you don't really want a computer that has, say, even a 5% error rate. Right? I mean, you're, you're looking at the, you're relying on these for, for, for GPS and for, for math problems, right? <laughs> for directions, for, for everything. We're giving, giving answers to things. And if it was wrong 5% of the time, that's really just not good enough for what we need in life. And these are wrong more than that, right? So there's this issue of error correction. So you can make a big chip like this, but it's still going to be wrong a lot because of all this decoherence and quantum noise that comes into it. And so this is really the big challenge, that we're still working on things like t-coherence, error correction, input-output, and it turns out that we may need thousands of qubits to be better than classical when we take these into account. And so it's not impossible, but people are still, you know, they still need to be built up. Um, just to mention, there's other sorts of, of quantum computers. There's now semiconducting quantum computers. I, this is an example of a device, looks like the, uh, the nan nanotube device I showed you. This has a lot of just fabricated wires, and I think those dots are where the where the qubits are. Um, impurities in, in, in bulk semiconductors, these have long coherence times, even though they're, they're only at the two qubit stage, processor stage so far. There's also um, photonic and, and atomic um, quantum computers. This is a trap of, for ions, actual physical ions that are trapped using laser beams. And so lasers trap the, um, the atoms and uh, the ions, and uh, they're used for processors, and they have now have five to seven qubit processors. Uh, these have really long coherence times, but it's not really easy to scale them. You need bigger and bigger and more and more lasers, which are even more expensive than, than, than refrigerators that get things cold. So this is a little bit hard to scale. Okay, and, and I just want to mention, I focused on quantum computing today, but there's a whole world of quantum information out there that people are actively working on. Things like um, you know, quantum cryptography, quantum communication, teleportation, which I, I spoke to my colleague Paul Puyat, who, uh, whose, whose slide this is, and I said I wanted, when the snowstorm came, I asked him if he could teleport me here. Um, and, uh, and he said, I could try, but each, at, each atom only has 50% chance of surviving. <laughs> so you should try four-wheel drive, which I, which I did. So, 
<laughs> you know, so there's, there's issues for some of these things, but, but there's, there's a lot of really fundamental, interesting research going on in all of these areas, as well as a lot of work trying to apply these technologies in various and interesting ways, using all sorts of things from atoms to photons to superconductors and semiconductors. <clears throat> and you know, I just want to end with the fact that there's a lot of interesting, fundamental research still going on, a lot of different sorts of devices that could be studied. Okay, so this is the end. We've talked about going through the quantum tunnel, basics of quantum mechanics, wave particle duality, uh, measuring quantum electronic devices, um, thinking about quantum computers, and if I had to uh, summarize the state of these things, I'd say that um, it's not clear how successful they'll be, but our lives will be interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. for questions. Before I start, though, I will remind everybody that there is a reception in the Ohio State Traditions Room uh, after the lecture. And I'm also going to have a preference for younger questioners. So I will encourage <laughs> younger questioners to ask their questions. Are there any questions? <laughs> Do you want to be really want to set an age? Start guessing ages here. I don't, I don't want that. I'm glad you think I'm young. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I used to work in communications, and uh, this concept of entanglement is interesting. Is state information transmitted through entanglement traveling at the speed of light, or is it instantaneous? <laughs> That's a hard question. Um, <laughs> it, infor information cannot pass. Inform information cannot be transferred faster than the speed of light. So there is no information that can tra travel faster than the speed of light. Um, that said, I think the question being asked is this idea that if I have, if I have, say, two particles, let's say, like my two particles look like this. Okay, one's up and one's down. And they're entangled, meaning that I have a wave function where they have equal probability of being in either of these states. And when I measure it, I'll measure, you know, if I measure this state is up, then this state has to be down. Or I can measure this state is up, and then this one has to be down. And I have equal probability of both of those. Now, if I separate these over a distance larger than information can travel, right, meaning that the distance is further than what I have the speed of light, you know, what I get from traveling at the speed of light over some time scale, once I measure something on this side, the state on this side is completely determined, even though no information is passed. Right? So if this one's up, this one's down, or if this one's down, this one's up. Right? And this is one of the seeming paradoxes of, of quantum mechanics. So it's not actual information being passed, it's the state of the system that is being measured. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> How you initiate a state and how it develops. I mean, you put in a one or a zero, or you put in some kind of number, right. and it develops, and then later on you get it back out. Right. Do you mean for a quantum computer or for a? Yeah, that's hard too. <laughs> and, and actually, that's, that, I mean, one of one of the difficulties in quantum computing is learning how to address all these all these qubits, right? And how to address how to get information in and taken out. So it's not this is not a solved problem. Um, one of the things that people do is they is you can you can take information from a a physical electronic qubit and then connect it to photons. So basically, you can excite them with microwaves, and microwaves will change the state of the system. So if the separation between the energy levels is usually in, in that energy microwave energies. So by applying a microwave, you can change what state it's in and initialize it that way, and you can address all the different qubits with their own microwave connectors, and therefore initial, initiate, initialize um, every qubit in there, right, in one state or another, or in a superposition state, if it's a known state. Um, and then you can let it go, and it performs a calculation that's based on its initial state. And then after it's done, you can then read it back out by connecting it to a diff another microwave cavity. Right? So a microwave cavity might tell you, you know, depending on the state, you'll get information in the photon energy of the cavity, and then that can be read out by later connecting it to a different electronic system. So that, that's, that gives you a sense that's one of the things that's being done right now. 
Um, but it's it's complicated, and there's that's one of the the difficult the challenges I think in doing quantum communications. Uh, yes. What do you think is the most exciting use for quantum sciences in technology? You know, upcoming. What sort of field would be the most uh, useful or exciting to you? All the fields. What's the most useful or exciting? They're they're all useful and exciting. <laughs> um, you know, so, okay, this gives you a sense of some of the different quantum fields out there. Um, from a fundamental point of view, right, this fundamental science, I think quantum metrology, which is doing sort of non-invasive measurements and measurements beyond the classical limit, is, is really interesting and something that people are understanding more and more about. So I think this is one of the really, this is an exciting area for fundamental physics. Um, for, for more applied areas, I think that uh, definitely quantum communication has come further in the past five years than I think anyone expected it to come, um, in terms of just the number of qubits that can be entangled and the technological problems that they've solved. And I think that as they push this technology, even if it becomes impossible to entangle more than a certain number of qubits, I think that the basic information that we get out of there will be both interesting and useful in ways that we don't anticipate. It's my real world. Is, um, is teleportation instantaneous? No. <laughs> no, I mean, like I said, nothing, nothing, you're right, so, okay, so, so, so nothing, nothing travels faster than the speed of light, but this idea of teleportation was related to this first question before, is do you know this, you know, once you figure out the state of one, of one entangled, particle, you know, if something's entangled, once you know the state of part of it, you know the state of the rest of it. So I think that's what people sometimes mean by teleportation, that even over long distances, you can transmit, there, there's state information that can be known. Um, so it's not something that, um, it's not something that's instantaneous in any real sense, and it's not something that can be used for heavy objects like us, unfortunately. Um, because there's always a probability that it's going to be in the other state. Is there any kind of physical <clears throat> object that is involved in a teleportation like that? Well, you can use photons, for example, which is a, I mean, so photons, particles of light, are what are typically used for this sort of thing. So you take light, several states of light, let's say different polarizations of light, and you put them in a state where, let's say, two photons have equal probability of being polarized one way and another, and then you separate them over long distances, and when you measure the state of one, you know the state of the other. Right. That's that's what we mean by teleportation, but it's not. So it's a physical object. If you're asking whether there's a massive object that's been involved, there could be a massive object that hasn't been shown over such long distances because those tend to decohere more easily. But theoretically, there could be a massive object. But again, you have to have something that maintains entanglement over, you know, without being perturbed by the environment. And that's that's very hard as you get to larger and larger systems with more and more energy. So so photons are very have zero mass. They're, they're easy to stay, keep in the same state. Other things are not, unfortunately. Could you say what kind of devices that you're currently measuring? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think some of them, I'm measuring these, 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 these topological devices are, are things that, that we're measuring right now. Um, where are they? So, so this is this is a device that we've this is something we've measured relatively recently. Um, it's a, it's a new material, um, and like I said, it's something it's something that was predicted and just verified within the past ten years. Um, it has surface states, but non-conducting bulk, and the properties are not well known. And so we've been trying to understand its properties better. We did this experiment to verify that it did indeed have a robust surface state that was coherent. That wasn't something that was well known. And by looking at interference, you can show that the surface state on this thing can support electron interference, which means that um, the electrons stay in the same state as they go around both ways. Um, we also connect these things to, to superconductors, which is another area of my research, uh, to see if um, what other behaviors appear. Uh, there's, there's a whole, there's, there's, there's so many topics here, right? There's a whole other area of quantum computing, what they call topological quantum computing, which, um, 
is interesting, but maybe less robust as a future technology than other sorts of quantum computing. But that has to do with connecting these <coughs> superconductors. So it's applicable towards chips. These, okay, so what, so what we're trying to figure out, these are so new, right? They were just really discovered within the past 10 years that we're seeing if they're applicable toward any sort of quantum computing, if they're applicable for making dissipationless interconnects because they have these robust surface states, um, if, uh, if they're, we're bracketing an experiment looking to see if they're useful for new sorts of nano inductors, for example. So um, all of these things are things that when you find new materials, you want to see what are their fundamental physics how do they behave? And then once you start understanding that, are there things that they might be useful for? So yeah. One more question. Yeah. Uh, just wondered, can you use supercomputers, quantum supercomputers, actually to measure electric kind of signals in the brain where that signaling could be disrupted, could be normal, could be remediated with medication or whatever? Yes, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's some, I mean, so so I believe people do this already. Um, as I understand it, the the difficulty is understanding the complexity of the brain, not the wires that are connecting to it. But I don't know. Is anyone biology? <laughs> yeah, is that true? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So 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 you can do that, but but I think that the, the brain is you know the brain is its own system that is not well understood. So it's not. I think it's not necessarily the wiring now. What you could do with, with quantum computers, potentially you know, with, with this sort of thing, is you could look at, um, you know, with so many connections, can you can you mimic brain processes once you have so many possibilities? And this is something that people are doing, trying to mimic brains using computers. You don't even need a full quantum computer for this. You just need something that tries many different possibilities, even if it doesn't land on the exact right one, lands on something that seems right, which is pretty much what our brains do. Um, so there are computing you know, efforts to make things that act like brains. And that's actually a really new area of, of quantum computing. The data generated is massive, though, and I think this is where quantum computers would come in. Yeah, that's right. So sorting. Math. Sorting databases, right? I mean, when, so I, I kind of made, you know, made a joke about why do we need these things? Is it really going to help our lives? But if you think of the vast quantity of information that we generate in everything that we do, there's a real problem with sorting this information. And quantum computers would definitely help sort all this information in ways that can make it more understandable and useful for us, including things like brain and biology. Okay, um, I'll remind everybody that we have a reception, so if you have questions, I would encourage you to go to the reception.